My fellow North Carolinians, throughout our great state, more than 10,000 men and women are engaged in the most important work that can be done, the saving of human life and the reduction of human suffering. For many years now, these dedicated men and women and the communities they serve have borne the full burden of coping with the problem of providing emergency medical services to our acutely ill and the seriously injured in this great state. In 1973, our General Assembly enacted legislation and provided funds to provide help in this crucial area for our entire state. This film provides us with an opportunity to share with you where we have been, where we are now, and where we hope to be in order to improve the quality of emergency medical services in North Carolina. For that reason, I ask you to pay particular attention because it is important to you and to your loved ones. We go beer, Jack. How about a ham? Anybody want to buy this ham before I hang it up? How much you want for it? Nine and a half pounds. Hey. Run you about 1580. Too much. <laughs> Misfortune, tragedy, disaster. The darker sides of living, which, with a certain inevitability, seem always to happen along just in time to ruin a day or wreck a life. Not a new force to be reckoned with, but old foes to whom we give our grudging respect and whom we are committed to defeating some way, somehow. There's a will, there's a way. The early settlers who first came to the flatlands, the rolling hills, and the high country of North Carolina brought with them this profound credo. Over the years, it not only has sustained them, but enabled them to flourish. Reinforcing that credo is another powerful and fundamental attitude, summarized and immortalized in the phrase, you do for yourself or you do without. Where there's a will, there's a way. Do for yourself or do without. Two simple phrases that to a large degree embody the perspective of a people. In our commitment to defeating or at least reducing the effects of misfortune, tragedy, and disaster, North Carolina has been guided in large part by the philosophy embodied in those simple phrases. In a civilized, complex, and humane society, there simply must be a system to provide help to persons suffering from acute illness or serious accidents. For generations, this was our system in North Carolina. 
For generations, funeral homes provided most of our ambulance services. But during the period of jolting change accompanying the decade of the 60s, many funeral homes discontinued their ambulance services and concentrated on providing funeral services. The trend swept the state, creating consternation and confusion. In that period of adjustment, many communities found that the adage, where there's a will, there's a way, was still viable. One of those who has observed closely the way in which communities have coped with the new realities of a new era is F. O'Neill Jones, former state senator from Wadesboro and chairman of the North Carolina Emergency Medical Services Advisory Council. During the dark days of World War II, Winston Churchill, speaking of the vital role of the members of the Royal Air Force, said, never has so much been owed by so many, so few. That statement might well describe the situation in North Carolina in the mid-1960s as a relatively small group of men and women rose to a unique challenge, and they provided services desperately needed by communities throughout this state. Many of those early rescue squads and volunteer units operated with poor equipment and with very little training. They did the best they could with what they had, and there are people alive today who wouldn't be alive if it were not for the contributions of volunteers who saw their duty and did it. They saw their duty and did it. Case in point, the small eastern North Carolina town of Wendell. By the late 60s, both funeral homes serving the town and surrounding farming area already had announced plans to discontinue ambulance services. Wendell resident Norman Dean, who helped form his community's rescue squad, explains the problem his community confronted and solved. When you look back, you have to realize that things are a lot better now than they used to be in the area of emergency medical services. The funeral homes that served this community did the best they could, but that wasn't very good. It simply amounted to transportation for the ill or injured. Like every community, Wendell has all types of emergency situations. And we know now that a lot of lives have been lost simply because those who responded to emergency situations were not properly trained to deal with life or death situations. Although the funeral homes announced in the mid-60s that they were discontinuing emergency medical services, they didn't just quit overnight. We had time to plan and to work, and we took advantage of it. In its early days, the Wendell Rescue Squad had no modern vehicles such as this. Squad members felt fortunate in being able to purchase an old postal truck and convert it into an ambulance of sorts. It was a start, though, and over the years, the community, mostly on its own, has continued to improve its emergency medical services in many ways. Back in, all closer to the van. Among its array of modern equipment are boats and special rescue tools to deal with drowning and a special hydraulic extractor to free victims of severe automobile crashes. Instead of one old converted postal truck, there are three modern EMS vehicles such as this one. Those are the most visible signs of change, but there are others equally important. Throughout the course, you'll be averaging uh, a few hours with physicians and a great many hours with practical exercises. And we hope that through this practical exercise... There are 25 members of this squad, and all of them have completed or are in the process of completing an 81-hour training course in emergency medical care offered by the Office of Emergency Medical Services. The EMT is a vital link. It connects the hospital, connects your squad. Connects Not every community has made this much progress or has approached its EMS problem in the same manner, of course. In some areas of the state, the responsibility for providing emergency medical services rests with local government. This unit, which serves one of the most populous regions of the state, has earned high marks from the medical community for the quality of its service. 
15 to 20 or something like that. In other communities, commercial operations, sometimes subsidized by a local government, is the primary provider of emergency medical services. A state as large and as diverse as North Carolina can accommodate and frequently profit by many different solutions to similar problems. As a state senator, O'Neill Jones was in a key position to help improve emergency medical services throughout North Carolina. As the chairman of a special legislative study commission, the Anson County lawyer participated in a study of emergency medical services available in the state. At the same time, an additional study was being conducted for the governor's highway safety coordinating office. The conclusions of both studies provided cause for alarm. Researchers found that no region of North Carolina had adequate, acceptable emergency medical services. In a nutshell, the situation was simply not enough equipment, not enough personnel, not enough training for those EMS personnel who were at work. Confronted with hard proof of grim conditions, the 1973 General Assembly took decisive action. It enacted legislation providing for the establishment of one of the nation's first state EMS organizations, an agency whose purpose was not to replace the efforts of local EMS groups, but to aid, assist, and complement in important and far-reaching ways the work of dedicated volunteers and others at the local level. At the outset, $750,000 was appropriated to the Office of Emergency Medical Services. In 1974, the General Assembly was even more generous, appropriating more than two and a half million dollars. And the second line is the development of the survey. Why did we need a special office of emergency medical services? To bring coordination to an uncoordinated effort provide careful monitoring of activities that can mean the difference between life and death, and to train EMS personnel to the highest standards possible. All of those goals haven't been achieved fully, of course, but significant progress has been made in a relatively short period. Dr. George Johnson, Vice Chairman of the North Carolina Emergency Medical Services Advisory Council and Professor of Surgery at the University of North Carolina School of Medicine, explains one important area of improvement. The most apparent improvement is a tremendous upgrading of our training programs for emergency medical personnel throughout the state. Not many years ago, almost anyone could drive an ambulance. There were no standards, so those who were in the business of providing emergency medical services simply had no way of knowing whether they were doing their jobs right. For the most part, ambulance drivers and attendants simply had to rely on common sense for complex medical problems. When communities had begun to provide emergency medical services, they became aware of the need, not just for people, but for trained people. We moved from one-day schools with no testing or evaluation to a 24-hour course, then on to an 81-hour course. We aren't able yet to determine the full benefits of this training, but we do know the death rate from accidents on our streets and highways has been dropping steadily for the past several years. We have a busy agenda today. I certainly appreciate you coming, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I thought we might start off today with a report on the mobile training lab, Tom. And with adequate funding and a commitment at the highest level of government, North Carolina moved rapidly on many fronts to improve emergency medical services. As a first step, a team of highly qualified EMS specialists was recruited from throughout the nation. The central staff is complemented by a corps of regional EMS coordinators stationed at key locations throughout North Carolina. Eighteen regional EMS councils, whose combined membership totals nearly 400, plus, of course, the state EMS advisory council, which provides continuing guidance and supervision. 
Such a system permits input from the local level so that progress in solving local problems and meeting local needs can be achieved. The chief of the Office of Emergency Medical Services is Charles Speed, former commander of the North Carolina State Highway Patrol. It was my privilege and pleasure to join the Office of Emergency Medical Services about two years after it had been established. While I am relatively a newcomer to this particular type of work, I'm no stranger to tragedy and suffering. As a member of the State Highway Patrol for more than 30 years, I saw plenty of pain, suffering, and death, and I came to know firsthand of the great need for competent, reliable, and fast emergency medical services. An effective EMS system consists of a number of crucial components, transportation, personnel training, treatment facilities, public education, communications, data gathering and evaluation, inner hospital transfer arrangements, funding, programs that draw on federal, state and local resources, and above all, public support. North Carolina is making definite progress in all of these component areas, and today, Every North Carolinian can take pride in the fact that his state has created the framework for the most progressive and comprehensive emergency medical services system in the entire nation. North Carolina has made progress in all component areas during the past two years. More progress is anticipated in coming months and years. One important goal is to assure that every ambulance vehicle in use in North Carolina meets minimum standards of design, construction, equipment, maintenance, operation, and cleanliness. Already North Carolina is close to the goal of assuring every accident victim that the ambulance transporting him will be staffed by a certified emergency medical technician. Very soon, every hospital in the state will be classified as to its capability for providing emergency medical care, and every ambulance crew will have that information in order to prevent delivery of a patient to a facility that cannot provide the needed care. Very soon, a series of emergency treatment centers will be identified and developed so that every accident victim will be within reasonable reach of an appropriate facility. And of course, continued improvements will be sought in communication systems and in the establishment and enforcement of proper training and performance standards for all EMS personnel. Certainly those old foes, misfortune, tragedy, and disaster will not soon be eliminated. For now and time to come, we must contend with their presence and their potential for harm. In this continuing effort, the phrase, where there's a will, there's a way, is more than a simple catch line. It is the rallying cry of a people determined not just to survive, but to prevail. <laughs>